Einen schönen guten Nachmittag. Ich hoffe, es hat euch allen geschmeckt und ihr habt auch alle was Leckeres zu essen bekommen. Es freut mich, dass bei schönem, strahlenden Sonnenschein trotzdem so viele Menschen jetzt äh, den Weg hierher an den Audi Max gefunden haben zu unserer... Um, we're very glad to be able to, to welcome all of you here, uh, where we're going to discuss issues of justice when it comes to the uh, food system and to our food provision. And just a quick remark, this event will is filmed live and there's a live stream on the internet for others to follow us. We have uh, three languages here at the panel, uh, uh, English, German and Spanish. So if you don't understand any of these uh, um, questions, uh, any of these uh, languages, um, German, you can listen to German in uh, at channel zero. Um, um, English is at channel two and Spanish is at channel four. Spanish translation, it's channel four. Channel four isn't working, she said. It's not working. It seems that channel four is not working. It seems channel four is not working at the moment. But uh, I hope uh, this can be fixed quickly. Okay. Economy, prosperity, and growth. These three aspects um, actually um, still form the basic principle in all areas of our societies and of our economy. Uh, when it comes to political decisions and political framework conditions that are set up. And um, everything is, is or points towards development. Everything is oriented uh, toward, towards development and is supposed to serve it, uh, the increase of prosperity and well-being in society. Um, of course, that entails the ruthless exploitation of labor and uh, the workforce and issues of social justice or participation and co-determination are ignored or relegated to a second standing. And also questions of ecological sustainability. And that holds true also for our food system, for our agriculture. Uh, it is also um, subjected to that uh, growth, the fetish to that growth imperative. Uh, the agricultural uh, companies also uh, have to operate on a uh, for-profit basis. The consequences are devastating, not only for our food system, but also for the environment. Um, the intensive farming uh, decreases biological diversity. The uh, water sources and the water supplies are polluted and uh, uh, water is ever more scarce, and of course, climate change is also um, increased. So, actually, there is a, or there, it, it seems to be that there is an easy way out or a conclusion uh, that we can say that there cannot be an endless exploitation of the resources of our planet. Um, I mean, that entails a very uh, severe, a very dire reality for many people. Um, I, I'm referring to the situation of, um, of the people in the global south. A trickle down has failed, as we know. The current uh, system of growth, uh, the current uh, principle of growth, implies a rise in inequality worldwide. Uh, one third of uh, humanity uh, own 50% of the assets, and uh, the tendency is increasing. So. How can we uh, structure our farming 
uh, in a more uh, sustainable manner. And that all is happening despite enough food is produced in order to uh, feed 12 million people. So we have a huge uh, distribution and equality question here and problem. Now many uh, marginalized uh, groups of population, the small uh, farmers, peasants, pastoralists, uh, landlers, currently in the globalized agricultural and food system are marginalized more and more. They lose, for example, access to um, important resources such as biodiversity, such as land as, and also water. Now the question is, uh, which we are going to deal with today, and wh what we need to do as well, it's not only about how we can uh, uh, create material wealth and how and how can we leave this, uh, let this agricultural system grow in order to leave the status quo? But the question is more, how can we cre uh, create certain concepts of food and agriculture that are sustainable for the future and that have the opportunity to feed people with healthy food and also that we have a social justice and a social distribution and at the same time that we protect our resources. In order to approach these topics, we have now four panelists here today, Three Three panelists are here currently, and one person will be um, joining us from the U.S. We have one uh, person who is um, uh, Reinhard Benning from Friends of the Earth, Germany. She has decided philosophy and uh, you know he uh, studied uh, philosophy and also agriculture. Sorry, she. Now, Reinhard, for many years now has been working at Bion, at Friends of the Earth of the Germany for more than 10 years. Lucia Galado is also here with us today. Lucia is living in Spain currently. She comes originally from Ecuador, and she's currently a PhD student at the Institute of uh, Technology, Environmental Technology. Now, for ma more than uh, 15 years, she's been involved in various environmental issues. Among these issues is uh, seed uh, and also the defense of seed uh, against uh, huge uh, corporations. She was also uh, engaged in the Sumac. Uh, uh, no, she was also uh, engaged in the Yasuni movement to leave the oil in the um, in the ground. Now, the other person who's here today is Christiana Schuller from Tom de Schloss. Well, she is living in a community uh, project in uh, Thuringia. And for one and a half year, years, or two years, she started a dairy uh, project. She has three dairy cow and has her own um, uh, farming. And with that, what she does is she supplies f uh, dairy products to the people um, in her vicinity. She, she has worked in um, various uh, uh, places around the world. And Okay, I'm glad that she's here today because apparently she today is the day where they are producing hay, but she is here with us today. Now, virtually, we have our guest, Eric Holt Kemenez from Food First. He comes from the U.S. He's the director of Food First and is also involved or grew up in an agriculture business. About 25 years, he lived in uh, Central America and uh, worked with uh, peasant farmers uh, and food growers. He tried to create modern innovative methods uh, for agriculture and also implemented them. He studied as well. He studied international agricultural development and holds a PhD in environmental studies and has uh, lectured in many universities worldwide. Before he started at Food First, he worked at the Bank Information Center. This is an institution that was created by the World Bank and was in the sector for Latin America. America. 
My name is Jan Ulreim. I work at Encota Network as a speaker for uh, food and agriculture, and I'll be the moderator this afternoon. Before we start, I'd like to say two uh, um, sentences. First, I'll elaborate the objectives, and then I'll also tell you a bit the schedule. We have two objectives today. First and foremost, we want to see what, what are the current problems and also challenges in the agriculture and food uh, system. What are the frameworks and what are the people confronted with who live or who work in agriculture and will have two perspectives on that. First, we want to see how are the social and ecological problems there and we also want to see what are the problems in the global north and also the global south. Our second big uh, objective for today is not only to complain, it also but to see what are the approaches for a sustainable agriculture and um, food system which, which we have today already, which we need to disseminate, and what are the strategies in order to bring about a transformation of the food system. Now today's um, uh, session will be organized as follows. We have two uh, rounds of questions. The, we'll start with a um, mm, message from uh, Eric. And um, after every session, there's a possibility for you, the audience, to ask questions. So we'll now start. Reinhold, the first question to you. Now, from your perspective as a, a member of the uh, a, a uh, Friends of the Earth in Germany. Now, what are your daily confrontation? What are the daily problems, challenges in your daily work? Thank you very much. So I'll speak from the perspective of uh, BUND, Friends of the Earth Germany, but also from the perspective of the agricultural movement, uh, an association of uh, um, producers and consumers, but also uh, consumer protection agencies. The industry and agricultural businesses, uh, Bayer, Leverkusen, uh, BASF, and other petrochemical agricultural businesses, they're trying to um, uh, um, get control, complete control over our food system. And an important role, the uh, um, um, the meat industry has a huge role to play, to play in that uh, scramble for power. And there was a conference that took place in Berlin a couple of years ago on that uh, issue of uh, meat producing, industrial intensive um, farming, uh, animal farming, um, actually moved and mobilized uh, many people to come to Berlin to uh, um, take action collectively to change because every every gram of uh, cheap meat that is produced less actually contributes to the uh, creation of wealth and well-being all over the world so cheap meat uh, that comes from intensive animal farming um, we when we go in, into the shopping center and uh, pay for it maybe for a euro but we pay for it six times one time when we get it over the counter, it and it appears to be cheap when we get it there, when we buy it in the supermarket, but we buy it with uh, um, ecological damages that are the consequence of animal farming. For example, in Germany, the industrial animal farming actually leads to the over-fertilization of our agricultural landscape, uh, of, of our uh, soil, and that is actually putting a lot of pressure on our drinking water. And uh, our uh, water utilities have to pay between 8 and 20 billion euros per year uh, in order to treat that water and to uh, clean the water and, and to, to rinse the water uh, again in order for us to be able to use it again and to drink it again. Um, at the same time, health costs are increasing. Um, due to industrial animal farming, intensive animal farming, mass animal farming. Now let me give you an example. Um, antibiotics are used, uh, anti antibiotics are rampant uh, in this uh, industry. Um, 
100% um, of um, a dairy farming um, is done with um, uh, antibiotics. Also in uh, poultry farming and other areas of meat uh, pr production, antibiotics are used. Uh, especially there is a form of antibiotics, uh, new varieties of antibiotics are increasingly used in animal farming uh, because other types of uh, antibiotics do not uh, work anymore and do not help anymore, do not prevent um, diseases anymore. And that is helped, that is supported by legislation in Germany that has been uh, put in place uh, fairly recently. So. What impact does that have on health costs? They came up with a calculation treating a person without antibiotic uh, resistance uh, is about or costs about seven thousand euros. And treating a, a person that is resistant to certain types of antibiotics. Um, costs about 14,000 euros uh, on average. So we see how our uh, practices in animal farming actually lead to an increase in uh, not only the ecological, uh, negative ecological consequences, but also, also the uh, um, health and the health costs. So it has a negative impact on our health system as well. And on our health, um, we have to look at the uh, uh, enormous subsidies that are granted to uh, a animal farming. And we're subsidizing the industry. We're paying the industry, basically, uh, for, for continuing their uh, criminal business. And of course, and let's not forget the social costs. There are, there is an increasing level of uh, human rights violations uh, in countries where um, land is being used uh, to grow food, uh, not to grow foodstuffs anymore, but to grow animal feed. Um, um, through uh, often their land is taken away; they're deprived of their livelihoods because they don't have access to their land anymore. Uh, and then later, the uh, um, uh, food uh, that we do not eat here in Europe and the Western world is then dumped again for uh, 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 um, dumped again on the markets uh, and damages their uh, their own production and their own markets. Another aspect of this uh, cruel business is uh, actually when we look at how we treat the animals, uh, the uh, the technologies and uh, And actually, there's no moral ground anymore uh, for how we treat the animals in uh, uh, those farms. The access-driven and surplus-driven economy, economic system that we're um, that is that is in place at the moment, uh, leads to the fact. Uh, that uh, also animals are produced, that there's also an excess of animals that is produced every year. Uh, and we're talking about, for example, 50 million uh, chicken, female chicken. And we're talking about talking about the uh, calves that uh, are actually killed at, uh, uh, at one day of age. But our principle, the principle uh, that, uh, or I would like to stress that uh, if we buy less cheap meat, we uh, can actually increase our well-being. The uh, 25 uh, supermarket chains in Germany um, actually uh, sell or provide the, ma the majority of or the majority of food and uh, 95 percent of the uh, food to to us and I think we have to work on strategies how to raise awareness for more conscious uh, um, uh, shopping when it comes to meat for example
Thank you, Reinhold, for your input. Uh, one organizational point I want to med uh, mention. There is a petition going on. If you want to participate, please sign in. Now, Christiane, uh, on a meta level, you showed the uh, downsides or down points of an industrial agriculture. And through the, uh, showing the meat production, you showed us these points. Now, and you... Um, Andrea, you will t you have a small uh, holding, and maybe from your perspective, you can tell us your daily challenges and problems. Well, when you s introduced uh, me, you said the following. Over one and a half years, I have a very, very small uh, farming holding. It's a very small farm holding among so many big ones. Now, this experience has uh, marked me tremendously over the last years, and I will give you a report about my experiences from that experience. My experience is that agriculture has a lot to do with uh, the soil that we farm. Around me in Thuringia, and I have a very small farm, as I said. I only have about 10 acres of land, and I farm only about two acres of that. So around me, I have people who are not very conscious uh, with regard to their soil. They only farm relatively few crops, and the humus, the very um, productive um, soil is losing its productivity through their way of farming and that soil is the only soil that we have. We cannot increase that and that is something that I see every day. L agriculture that we have today is bad for our soils today and the soil cannot uh, regenerate and we cannot grow soil. On the other side, I also see agriculture around me which works with huge machines that use tremendous amount of, ener of energy. Nitrogen and mineral um, minerals are using up a lot of energy. So the Agriculture, I see here, is swallowing a lot of energy, even though the growing of things, basically, this is something that happens on its own. On its own. We see that with uh, plants. Plants have the um, tremendous potential to use uh, sun energy and carbon and produce energy because you don't need to put in energy. Energy comes is, uh, is the output. But the agriculture that we're using now is swallowing the uh, and sucking out that energy. And this is uh, what I see every day. And it, it really uh, astonishes me. In my small holding, I see that l agriculture is something that is very difficult to do, do. The land is distributed in the hands of big businesses, and those who want to to get involved, it's very difficult to do so. I was lucky. I had few of the meadows which I was able to, to use, but I needed also um, arable land and the arable land is very desired by so many and um, many and in, in over the last years it's been more and more and more difficult to get arable land and prior i really uh, uh, during my studies i uh, i got to know about land grabbing and now in my uh, practice i really see how that land grabbing is happening prices are increasing for land the situation is very complex. It's not a, only about money. It is also about uh, systems, a belief system. It's about structures. It's about structures which have always farmed uh, the land, and that is apparently that what is supposed to be continued. Uh, there are no uh, agreements. Now, the land. It is absolutely difficult to get hold of land. And if you want to change agriculture, more and more people have to get the opportunity to get involved in agriculture and farming. And the way uh, agriculture is organized today, it's very, very, very difficult to do so. I believe that we, I believe that the idea of owning parts of this planet is very weird and strange. We really have to look at how prospectively we can organize land. I don't, don't believe in uh, own property and owning land. Now, our long, that, that, w the way I want to f farm is that, uh, well, the way I, need, uh, I conduct agriculture now is like I have to play with the game. I have to 
really do what is uh, expected of me. I have to lease land and the lease is becoming more and more expensive. And this is problematic, but not only in Germany, worldwide it is a problem. I believe agriculture will change in future if new people are engaged engaging in agriculture, bringing in new ideas, and therefore I really believe things have to change. That is imperative. Thank you very much, Christiana. Now, we focused uh, strongly at a meta level on the consequences of uh, industrial agriculture. Christiana, you told us about your challenges in Germany, within your con your context, uh, on your small farm. Now, Lucia, can you tell us about your challenges and your problems in Ecuador, especially from your struggles uh, and confrontations that you were faced with? Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. I would like to speak about a different perspective. I would like to talk about how agriculture is developing in, uh, in Andean cul uh, uh, cultures, especially in Ecuador, for example. As you know, we are a country with different nationalities. We live in... Uh, in a diversity, a cultural diversity. It's an agriculture that depends on, um, or the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the indigenous indigenous. Uh, they depend on agriculture. Now, with regard to food independence, the. Now, the people want food independence. So the way in which um, agriculture is organized uh, is more local, is more small scale. And um, um, food sovereignty is always linked. The question of food sovereignty is also always connected with the issue of um, access to land, access to fisheries, access to water resources. Uh, a second component that is very crucial is the policy of knowledge. In the area of food sovereignty, there's a struggle around the knowledge that is available because the indigenous peoples have traditional knowledge in the area of agriculture. They have a special relationship with their uh, seeds. And that is part and parcel of their agricultural system. It is based on their traditional knowledge and their pr traditional practices. So, uh, they have talked about the collective control uh, over their seed. They have a system that is uh, striving to be equitable. They uh, try to uh, minimize uh, inequalities and imbalances. They struggled for not only for the access to land, but actually that they have a land title as well, that they own the land that they are working and that they and where they the, the territories that they live in so they have the practices uh, their their practices are very different from uh, industrial agriculture and from conventional agriculture as uh, as we know it from from the west what we see in recent times is that the uh, the base the foundation of food sovereignty is uh, is actually decreasing is is dissipating um, and, and now the state is intervening with uh, uh, different policies and uh, also with providing seed 
Uh, and that leads to the fact that many of the indigenous uh, peoples, many of the indigenous communities, are actually losing access to their seeds, uh, which is the basis of their livelihood. So whenever a variety of a seed, seed varieties is lost. When seed varieties are lost, the knowledge is lost. And that is why the struggle for um, the uh, uh, or remaining in control over the over the uh, over the seeds uh, is uh, essential when it comes to securing food sovereignty. There are communities that uh, achieved to politicize their struggle. and try to understand the importance or the, the significance of uh, uh, the local dimension and the regional dimension in the agricultural system. Because the local dimension is actually the main actor or um, the main um, the 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 um, the main actions or the uh, uh, the greatest agency is actually at the local level, and uh, the local and and genders uh, not only the uh, uh, identities but much much more uh, that is necessary in order to secure food sovereignty. The food sovereignty is now um, also a, a responsibility of the state to, to, sec to secure uh, food sovereignty. What is also important is that the key focus of the strengthening and the role of agriculture is also uh, strengthened, starting from the seed until the crop. Agricultural cooperatives should have control over chains and to that power is broken however this is very difficult but within states and also with respect to the states and the global markets this is what is causing a lot of problems but also generating benefits for some groups genetic variety still existing, that is very good. The communities there have uh, understood how important it is to exchange seeds. They also were able to continue. They were also able to continue the, the fight and also influence the state to give them their control. They are negotiating the minimum conditions in order to have access to food, to land. And uh, they are fighting for food sovereignty because without the control of, of seed and also having uh, the control over the sea, there is no food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is not going to be possible. Thank you very much, uh, Lucia, for your um, experience and also for your input from the Ecuadorian point of view. Reinhold, you told us a lot about uh, industrial agriculture. Can you tell us a little bit about the actors who are involved? What are their interests, and what are their what, what are their interests actually? Their potential interests. Well, thank you very much. Well, Lucia mentioned uh, quite a lot. Uh, the seed industry is a problem because it uh, pursues a strategy which, uh, for market terms, makes sense. They're saying we produce seed through GM. 
they also using the right uh, injection. And they're saying also, we, are, um, we have connections with the food industry who are, uh, who, to whom we distribute our products. And they're also saying that we also develop the, the, the medication that is needed for huge companies. We have huge company, pharma companies that, like uh, BISF, and they are buying from the seed producers. And that is a problem. Now, if we try to structure this, what is the... the the most important group are the consumers, which is the most powerful. But I'll come back to them la later on. We have the uh, um, gr uh, food uh, growers, the farmers. They are also uh, um, actors. At the me moment, the majority of the people are fed by farmers, by smallholders, for people, or farmers who are feeding their regional markets. And we, this is what we also want to maintain. And that is a democratically enshrined uh, principle. However, the growth pressure that was created by the businesses led to the fact that uh, food is now held by a small concentration of big companies. Now, for over twenty, uh, it, um, for many many years now, the problem is that the pig production in Germany is concentrated in few hands, and more and more farmers or who have not enough pigs. So what we see here is a is that smallholders have less and less power, and we see a structural change, which means that the food production is becoming less and less democratic, and this is what we are trying to fight. Now, with regard to the seed and chemical and fertilizer industry, this section want to have, they want to, uh, farmers who ha are able to buy, so they want subsidies. Now, the industry s want farmers to get subsidies from the state so that they buy these agribusiness products. And then there are the, the slaughterhouses, they are the ones buying the products from the farmers. One would n think that they have another interest than the farmers because they w want to get the cheap uh, resources from farmers, and farmers want cheap prices. But what we see today here, the German uh, Farmers Association are actually working together with the b lobby groups, and they are actually doing... Uh, um, they're, they're basically cooperating. So what I deplore is the fact that the concentration is back becoming more and more, so m monopolies are being created more and more. And the price competition is shaped in such a way that we prices are dropping more and more. And now the state comes in. They sh uh, the state should regulate everything. They should do that. However, the state is not doing so. The state is basically allowing big companies to do whatever they want to. For example, um, huge grazing lands are being uh, used for mass um, animal production. And the state is also allowing for the fact that consumers are not able to see whether GMO has been used in uh, or not. And now the biggest powerful groups are the consumers. We, in the form of our movement, and also the fact that we buy everyday food, we can also do something. But nevertheless, the state is not informing the consumers. So now the movements, they are the ones who have to t take up that work and raise awareness and inform the consumers in order to show the consumers their global connections. And I'm really, really happy that this movement, this movement has, has helped to raise awareness among consumers. And through our awareness raising, food or meat 
consumption has reduced and that is for us a huge success and in Europe and in the US meat consumption is losing is, is dropping because consumers are becoming more and more aware in for example in, in the US in Asian countries all over the world they Consumers are understanding that big businesses are not working with it in the interest of their consumers. Consumers are realizing that the, the agreements that are um, concluded between state and agribusinesses are counterproductive for the uh, are counterproductive. They are not good for the consumers. So consumers are realizing that more and more. We have to make sure that our consumers are so well informed that they realize that they have to buy their produce from regional farmers in order to maintain alternative markets and also small markets and farmers. Thank you very much, uh, Reinhold. Um, let's turn to Eric now. I'd like to ask Eric to join our discussion. Eric, are you with us? Okay, uh, let's say just a few words um, to Eric. I think Eric can hear us, uh, but we can't see him at the moment. Uh, but we will see you a little bit later. Um, we really appreciate, Eric, that you're with us today because in, uh, he's based in Auckland and California, which means that uh, it's 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, um, so we really appreciate that you got up that early this morning, and uh, we're looking forward for all your ideas and uh, thoughts you're willing to share with us today. Uh, I'm going to switch from English to German again. Um, Erik hat uns, weil das mit wir so ein bisschen unsicher We were not sure how it would work uh, with Skype, that's why he sent a video where he is outlining the big challenges uh, with regard to food and agriculture at a global level and uh, also gives a little introduction to the concept of uh, food sovereignty and tries to make a differentiation or differentiate between uh, the growth system a food uh, system that is based on growth um, people are going hungry the world's food systems produce enough food to feed every man woman and child on the planet in fact, one and a half times enough food for everybody, we could feed 10 billion people today if much of the food wasn't going to livestock and to automobiles. We've had actually quite a bit of growth in the food system, and this has now solved the problem of hunger. In fact, over the last half century, the amount of food that we grow on this planet has grown by about 12% per capita per year. And at the height of the world food crisis in 2008 and again in 2011, when a billion people were going hungry, in fact we had record harvests. And we also had record profits for the agri-food monopolies controlling our food system. So clearly something has to change and simply growing more food isn't going to solve the problem of hunger. This contradiction runs even deeper when we realize that most of the hungry people in the world are farmers. They're peasant farmers. Some 70% of the hungry people in the world are peasant farmers and most of them are women. Nonetheless, peasant farms produced most of the food in the world and they do it on less than a quarter of the agricultural land on the planet. So there's a tremendous amount of inequity bound up in the food system which creates poverty and in turn creates hunger even in a world of abundance. And yet we hear over and over again from the multilateral institutions, from our government, from the FAO, from Bill Gates, that we need to double food production by 2050 if we want to end hunger. In fact, I think this is simply part of the productivist ideology of an extractivist and regressive food system. Regressive in that it does not redistribute the wealth within the food system, but it concentrates the wealth in fewer and fewer hands. And the food system very clearly reflects the modern ideological fetishism of technological growth. 
this growth primarily is to resolve the contradictions of overaccumulation of capital itself, not necessarily responding to need. It responds to market and demand, but not to need. And so even though we've seen spectacular growth in the food system over the last 50 years, we've also seen a tremendous amount of degrowth. And I emphasize that both the growth and the degrowth has been regressive. And by degrowth I mean that, for example, industrial crops have taken over over 140 million hectares, about the size of, of Western Europe, um, from peasant farmers. Small farmers are getting smaller in the sense that they're farming smaller and smaller plots of land. Large farms are getting bigger. There's a disappearing middle in many places as well. And nonetheless, small farms still continue to produce most of the food in the world. And most of these farmers are women. And for most of these small farms, they are more productive pounds per acre in terms of net primary productivity than our big farms. The construction of the corporate food regime is very important. There are some basic steps which were taken and which will have to be dismantled for a degrowth food system. The first step, of course, was in the 1960s and 70s with the Green Revolution, which transferred the industrial model of production from the Global North to the Global South. The second were all the structural adjustment policies imposed by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund on the countries of the Global South, which required them to liberalize their food systems and produce non-food products, which they could dollarize and basically depend on the North for their food and their, especially their grains. The third were, of course, the free trade agreements and the World Trade Organization, which sought to cement these structural adjustment policies into international treaty. This was a political maneuver so that people couldn't vote these policies out. The next step we've seen as a consequence of this has been the steady monopolization of food and food producing resources and the steady financialization of land. And finally, the continued disenfranchisement, violence, coercion, dispossession, and criminalization of smallholders around the world attempting to hang on to their land, attempting to defend themselves, and attempting to basically feed themselves and their communities. Food sovereignty, of course, implies taking back control over the food system, localizing the food system, creating a food system which is redistributive and not regressive, and creating a food system based on agroecological principles rather than on chemically based agriculture. For this type of a food system, we would need, first and foremost, the decommodification and the definancialization of food, land, labor, seeds, inputs, and capital, which means we would need an end of corporate monopoly rule. And we would have to grow our pluralistic forms of land use, usufruct, rather than of private holdings which can concentrate in capitalist markets. We would have to prioritize use values over exchange values. In other, in other words, we would have to prioritize need over demand. We would have to guarantee minimum income in the countryside, and we would have to guarantee a, a ceiling, a maximum income. We would have to guarantee land access, access to food producing assets, and we would have to move towards a food shed based subsidiarity 
producing what can be produced locally, locally, and importing those non-perishables which can't be produced locally from abroad. We would have to base our food systems primarily on agroecology, which decommodifies inputs, localizes our food systems and our, our food value chain, and is knowledge intensive and so is necessarily embedded in local communities and local agri-food systems. So what we've seen over the last 50 years is the construction of the corporate food regime. And what have been the results? Well, if in 1970 the Global South produced a billion dollar surplus in food, today they have an 11 billion dollar deficit in food. They become dependent upon the global market for much of their food. Industrial agriculture uses up 80% of the world's fresh water and contributes to at least 20% of the world's greenhouse gases. We've lost almost 80% of our crop biodiversity and the cost of just 20 years of trade liberalization just for sub-Saharan Africa has been 272 billion dollars. That's about the amount that the region received in aid during that time. We've seen massive immigration from the Global South out of the countryside and to the cities of the Global North, people looking for work. And of course, the tremendous concentration of the agri-food monopolies and oligopolies. I think that this all has implications for the concept of degrowth. Because we clearly need to degrow corporate power, corporate market power, corporate land power, corporate financial power. We need to degrow the global marketplace. We need to degrow industrial meat and the feed and fuel crops and the industrial fisheries. But we need to grow smallholders' access to land and land holdings and the production of basic grains and fruits and vegetables. We need to grow local agri-food businesses. We need to grow regional trade and sub-regional trade. We need to grow open source seed and technologies. And we need to grow the social wage in the countryside. That means that the surplus wealth which is produced can't all go to the cities. We need to reinvest in the countrysides. They have to be decent places to live. There are nearly three billion people living in the countryside. Most of them are not living well. If they're to be pushed off the countryside, there is nowhere to go. There is no new industrial revolution to sop up all this labor. The economy would have to grow at 15% a year over the next half century in order to absorb all of this labor. That can't happen even in a growth economy. So a degrowth economy has to grow the benefits in the countryside, has to grow the health centers, has to grow the schools. So clearly this means a complete transformation of the corporate food regime. And this is a daunting task, but we know some things about the corporate food regime. First of all, it's a capitalist regime which means that it's going to act the way capitalism acts. And capitalism always goes through two periods, a period of liberalization and a period of reform. And liberalization is usually characterized by unregulated markets, breathtaking capital concentration, followed by devastating busts. And I believe that's what we see today. From the 1970s, we've had the deregulation and the liberalization of the economies around the world, and the corporate food regime has been no exception. But capitalism also enters into a phase of reform in which markets and supply and consumption are regulated in an effort to restabilize the regime. And so we need to bring about reforms, and not just reforms which restabilize the regime, but reforms which transform the regime towards a food sovereignty, steady state regime. And this happens historically through strong counter-movements. 
There are always tendencies of reform and liberalization happening at the same time. But reformists are never able to push through reforms on their own. They need a strong counter-movement, a strong social counter-movement in order to advance reforms. And the counter-movement that we have in the food system today is food sovereignty movement. And the food sovereignty movement also has a reflection in the North and in the South. And in the North, it's often a food justice movement. But what we have are basically progressive and radical trends within this counter-movement. And what we'll need are strong alliances between the progressives and the radicals, those who go to the root, to the structures, who want to change the rules and the institutions, with those who are changing the practices, if we expect to build a strong enough movement, a counter-movement, capable of introducing and forcing transformative reforms. So I think that the conversation that we need to have today is how a degrowth movement can form alliances, tactical and strategic alliances, with the food sovereignty movement in order to create a viable social force for transformation that brings about the political will that we need to change the food system. very informative and encouraging speech. Um, Lucia, das, was wir jetzt alles von Eric gehört haben. Lucia, everything that we've heard now from Eric, what is your first reaction? He showed the historic development. At the same time, he said that food sovereignty is a counter um, concept. You also spoke about food sovereignty, and can you tell us now how such uh, uh, food sovereignty can also be implemented in the global south was uh, stronger? Vale, muy interesante la bueno. Well, this perspective was very interesting. It is important to understand how, how such food sovereignty functions, whether it's in the south or whether it's in the north. The power relations in the capitalist system, they need to be looked at. And that is absolutely important in order to find out where we are politically seen. Now for me, there's a fundamental element with regard to what Eric said. All these experiences in the production worldwide, for example in Europe, the rural experiences in the Andes and also in Latin America as a whole, these experiences, they need to be understood by us. We also need to understand that that is, there lies the key to food sovereignty. How can we combine the rural with the urban? That is the question that we need to tackle. Now with regard to agriculture, to the global agriculture, 
what is fundamentally important is to have control over the seed, to have seed control. I really long for another life. I long for a Europe full of indigenous people, of people who farm their own land and who have a huge variety of whatever crops, like potatoes or something. I'm very sad to see how dependent people are in such developed countries. I see how people are so dependent on these um, supply chains. People cannot f move freely. They are bound to these uh, food chains and these food supply chains. We need to free the seed, regardless where it is. Even though we are not personally um, connected to the to the soil, we have to make sure that we control seed because seed is live. And as soon as seed is patented, it is controlled. It is controlled by these legislations of um, intellectual property or the market. And we need to free the seeds from that. And we can only do that by recuperating the knowledge that we have lost. As long as we depend on two or three potato varieties or one or two tomato variety or just one um, cucumber variety, and if such a production is uh, connected to one single monopoly, then we have lost everything. If we no longer have any crop variety, we are lost. Therefore, we need the knowledge. We need to recuperate and regain the knowledge because what we are now doing is basically prostituting our knowledge. Now, what we need to do is to share our local knowledge and exchange um, that knowledge so that we regain that production chain in our own hands again. So growth or post growth, this is a huge, huge challenge indeed. Now the video showed us a truth. Peasants and farmers, they don't speak about degrowth or post growth. They speak about control. They speak about the control of production chain. They speak about the control of seed and also the control of land control of decision-making processes, control of the power and ma power relations. This is what they talk about. Of course, it is important uh, how the production is conducted. However, it is more important that we as social actors who are involved in that um, production chain, we have to know that the problem does not lie in the individual consumption decisions. Of course, our consumption decision has to be deliberate and conscious, of course. However, we need to be able to express ourselves politically in our uh, practices in order to free ourselves from the capitalist control. The new, rela the new relations, they have to be uh, realized. The realities that we need to create and develop in the global south, of course, can go hand in hand with uh, degrowth. But what is fundamentally important and what is the most important factor is, is distribution, decision making and control. Thank you very much. Now, before we give you, the audience, the possibility to ask questions or comments, I'll give Christiana the opportunity to respond with regard to what Lucia and uh, Eric have said. Well, I'm absolutely impressed and uh, very encouraged by what um, Lucia said and the, her perspective. She wants a Europe of um, small peasants and she sees what we have lost here in Europe and this is a very very valuable view which we often um, 
lack here in uh, in the north that perspective and what i want are my neighbors far my neighbor uh, um, neighbors on my farms who also have another idea of how to shape agriculture in a different way now what i've learned from eric's input was uh, agriculture of the future is knowledge intensive so it is based on knowledge it is based on the fact that the land that I farm, that I know it very well, that I know the climate, that I know what grows there, that I have ideas. This year, for example, in August, there was a lot of rain. And I can't make hay, so what do I do? Well, what I need to know is my location. And I have to have that kind of knowledge. So it's not only knowledge intensive, it's also learning intensive. I need neighbors with whom I can learn together. I had to laugh a little bit uh, when I received my invitation to come to this conference because I thought, well, degrowth, and I'm supposed to speak about degrowth, but well, what I love as a farmer is growth, actually. This is what I love. So now the nice thing about agriculture, it, it shows us what, how growth goes. And how, and that growing is, uh, is, is just a cycle. It's like dying and, uh, 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 and, and, and new creation again and with growing. And I, it's really nice to see that agriculture offers the, all these solutions. Everybody, who farms in an alternative way, everybody knows that they can grow food and they know that that is possible. Of course, one can conduct service about, my, uh, about me as a farmer, but I know really that I can farm with my farm in a way that I can feed people who are around me in my vicinity. And that is the knowledge that I have. I know that. I can tell you how it works, how to feed the people in my region, in my vicinity. Christiane, we'll have a second round and we'll talk about real existing alternatives. And there you can talk a little bit more about your own farm holding. Now, I want to give the audience the possibility to ask questions. There are a couple of uh, people who have mics and they will um, walk around. And what we're going to do, we collect three to four questions first. You can ask a specific question, but you can also just ask a general question to the audience. Eric is also listening, so you can also ask Eric the question. Uh, a question. So let's see where the questions are. We'll start at the right here, right at the top, and we and we all um, get to you all get to ask your question. The people who had raised their hand. comment and a challenge for uh, you panelists and uh, the discourse about food in the degrowth movement. I think uh, what I have heard now make me uh, the, the positive thing is that you stress uh, the question of social justice and, and ecological degradation which are question very important in the food production. But the question of uh, uh, social justice have been around since at least four decades. So there is, uh, in this sense, uh, there is uh, nothing new about the, pro the problem uh, of uh, distribution of food. <coughs> uh, what uh, was uh, I missing was uh, an important connection. And the fact that uh, the degrowth movement uh, has elaborated many concepts of nature which goes beyond anthropocentrism, which goes beyond the human egoism and human domination on the earth. Nobody of you mentioned the suffering and killing of billions of animals uh, for the food production. And this is a huge question, uh, the big elephant in the room, uh, even for question for social justice. The, uh, if you quoted uh, the problem of meat production, considering meat uh, as a food product as something else. But beyond the, behind the meat, uh, there are millions of animals killed uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, suffering for that. Even in the organic farming, they are deprived of parental relationship. They are uh, uh, underposing in vitro fertilization. There is the separation of the cows uh, from the calves, uh, all this stuff. So, so I think that the degree of movement has uh, really to take into consideration uh, the social justice for all sentient beings and uh, to consider the question of killing and suffering of animals, especially in Western countries where there is no reason of consuming animal products except for culinary pressure. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank für den uh, Kommentar. Es wäre total, also, ihr sollt auch alle die Möglichkeit haben. Thank you, thank you very much for this comment. And, uh, Please, can you try to be more precise with your statement or question? That would re be really, really good. My name is Haimo. I'll be very brief. In 2014, it would be really nice uh, at a degrowth conference, which unfortunately only have two human rights uh, events, it would be really nice not to talk about uh, animal um, rearing, but animal imprisonment. Thank you. empirical claim of one of the one of the panelists namely that animal exploitation and animal death in numbers is decreasing it is in fact according to a uh, 2007 FAO Glypha report it is increasing immensely and the world over now politically um, Small-scale agriculture the transition to locavorism as it is called in the United, in the United States and so on plays the ideological role of supplementing mass extermination of animals for food. It doesn't and has not until now led to a decrease, but further fuels the processes of which it is part. Thank you very much. Let's collect maybe one or two more questions. Um, we have to your hands so that I know where Okay, two more questions or comments, and then we'll get the panelists to speak. I will change the topic, and I'll refer to Christiane and uh, Reinel to what you both have said. There's something in there, and it's not uh, uh, expressed, it's not talked about, actually. This is my impression. And this refers to buying without involving companies, it also involves uh, the soil prices and also the consumers. I really believe that it's not necessarily helpful in this framework to demand purchasing or buying without involving companies. It's also not, make, it doesn't make sense to ask for for soil distribution without talking about soil prices. We are not only consumers, we are people who have to make sure that alternatives are created. However, I have the feeling that there is a bit of a resistance here to address certain things and as long as certain things are not clearly mentioned here, power relations will be perpetuated and will also remain very uh, blurred. A dogma of companies is a dogma of the system. And I would be really, really happy if the agricultural demonstration that takes place uh, in Berlin every year I would really like them to formulate their demands more clearly. Well, Christiane, it would be really nice if you were to say something about the land ownership uh, situation, especially your experience. What are the limits that you are faced with? How much is an acre in your area in Thuringia? Maybe you can just say a little bit about that. Thank you very much for the first uh, round of questions. There were two questions uh, directly to uh, Christiane and then one for uh, Reinhold and Christiane, but 
given that Eric had no question, maybe Eric, maybe you want to speak about the role of uh, animals in agriculture, livestock in agriculture. Eric, would you like to say something about the role of livestock in agriculture? Uh, much more than that. The, the point is, um, we, I understand the animal rights argument, and I'm very sympathetic to it. Um, but on small farms, um, animals play a, f a fundamental role um, in the reproduction of the, uh, of the farm itself and of the family, and in terms of uh, uh, labor power on the farm, and certainly fertility. But beyond just talking about farm animals, I, we have to talk about um, biodiversity and agrobiodiversity. And the problem with the um, industrial agri-foods uh, model that we have today is that it destroys biodiversity on the farm. And um, so then we have you know, these conservation organizations coming in and saying, well, what we have to do is agriculture is bad because it destroys biodiversity. So we need reserves. So they buy up land for reserves, which of course only increases the, the price of land. Um, and then so we have food on one hand and biodiversity on the other. And none of this is sustainable. If you read, uh, there's a concept called nature's matrix. Um, and this has been uh, scientifically uh, researched extensively. If you have, um, if you engage in an agroecological form of production, what happens is that you increase the biodiversity on the farm itself. And so the link between the farm and the forest or the farm and, and any uh, islands of biodiversity, uh, natural, uh, natural habitat out there, is strengthened. And in fact, what you find is that there, you increase the flow of uh, biodiversity between the farm and between the, the more natural areas. Because these natural areas are like islands. And you can, you're trying to create what, what uh, the conservationists tell us is that we need to create corridors between the islands and that the that agriculture is this vast, unbiological sea. And so that's absolutely true in the case of industrial agriculture, but we need to think about um, agro, agroecological agriculture, which in fact turns that inert sea into um, a source of biodiversity. And if we don't increase the biodiversity on the farms and on the non-farm areas, we're not going to be able to face the challenges of um, climate change because we simply won't have the resilience that we need. Biodiversity is one of the fundamental pillars of resilience. Okay, vielen Dank, Eric. Um Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody want to say something about uh, livestock rearing, meat, uh, meat production? And maybe you can also speak about land, the question on land, perhaps? Well, I'm a uh, um, livestock breeder, and I can say something about the, that. I have three dairy cows, and principally, I... I believe that in Germany we should have m less uh, livestock rearing. Absolutely, I agree with that. I heard from somebody that we, only ha sh we should only keep animals for, um, for cooking, basically. It, there are ethical reasons to say I categorically reject animal livestock rearing and I can understand that for those who have that opinion I don't share that opinion but I can understand people who say that ethically we should not use animals but there's not only a culinary reason to uh, livestock rearing it's also about um, uh, uh, cultivating the land properly in Thuringia in my um, region we have arable land and we have arable land that is not good for farming, either it's too dry or too moist. And it is 
and it is good that we don't have uh, arable land uh, there, that we also have grazing land, which is a really nice uh, place for animals. And for me, these areas, these grazing lands are really good. And we can have livestock rearing there and feed people on these lands, on these grazing lands. And this is the reason why I rear animals it's it's not only for cooking for killing them and and and, and feed and using their meat it's also for the land um, i understand people who say that elastic wearing is uh, something that they don't want to do and the many animals that are kept uh, uh, in Germany all, uh, are kept on arable land and not grazing land and arable land should be used for feeding people but not rearing animals animals should be reared on grazing land on pastoral land okay ruminants uh, ruminants ruminants is what we what we what we need because ruminants they have so many capacities they have four stomachs and they are really gr wonderful ruminants is that what we need now land prices, well, it's about money, of course, but in Thuringia, we're not speaking about huge, huge uh, acre prices. It's about 10,000 euro per acre. It's a lot of money. However, it's much more expensive in other regions of Germany, especially in the West. Now, why is it so difficult to get land? Why is it so difficult to get access to land. It has a lot to do with social pressure on, on villages. Many people have given their land or sold their land to agricultural cooperatives because they had to do that in the 1960s in my area. So there's a strong pressure to, to there's a strong pressure to sell land to big uh, agricultural um, businesses and what i do people laugh at me actually because they're saying oh yeah you're just a small holder you should you should sell your land to big holders so the reason why it's so difficult to access land it's not only about money of course it is a problem money but we should not only say well if the ownership uh, situation is uh, different, then maybe we can also organize agriculture differently. But I think uh, it's not a solution to solve the ownership or property uh, solution, but we have practical r things that we need to tackle before that. What I think is a very good uh, maybe solution is to keep land in communities, for example, to have collective land. That is a suggestion that I have that, that I would like to see more, not individually owned land. Thank you very much, Christiane. Reinhard, if I understand the question properly, the question was uh, to be more bold with regard to formulations and on demands. You spoke about livestock rearing and uh, contact with animals, etc. But can you just say a little bit about being more bold with formulations and demands? Well, in my contribution, I really try to speak about animal um, or livestock rearing, but I concur with what Christiane said, because as uh, friends of uh, the AF Germany, we work closely together with uh, farmers' organizations from all over the world, especially African farmers, especially African nomads organizations, which who they cooperate with my organization and we also cooperate with many others around the world. And they look at me quite funny when we say that livestock rearing is imprisonment. They look at me funny. Well, I believe personally that there are cultural uh, practices of livestock rearing that are ethically maybe supportable. I also respect that 1.4 million sm 
peasant farmers are living from livestock rearing. And I think there are cultural techniques for livestock rearing that are ethically okay. And on that basis, I would like to see a change of paradigm in agriculture to go back to that where culturally um, sustainable methods are used. Now, I'm not only always saying that land should be plowed. For example, my neighbor, as I, as I said, I'm a farmer. We till our land. And For me, it's not important. Uh, well, for me, what is important is that with degrowth, we have certain um, goals. But I want to see also what do we s want for the future. Now, if you demand a change in the system, it's something that I find a bit critical, actually. Before we have a second round of questions, Lucia, you have the opportunity to uh, respond uh, to what has been said and respond to the questions as well. There is a uh, insanity when we uh, look at, or in an insane situation when we look at agriculture. We have um, a, a division between nature and humans, between um, uh, different things. When we look at the different forms of life and the different um, uh, forms how we t treat animals and forms of life, of, uh, of animal life, we should focus much more on the values, uh, the communities, the values that are upheld in the communities, um, values such as uh, food sovereignty. Um, and there is no food sovereignty in the global south. There will be no s food sovereignty in the global south that uh, uh, diminishes or th the uh, role of livestock farming. So it is livestock farming is, is part and parcel of food sovereignty also in the global south. The problem is that uh, the capitalist production and the way we conduct livestock farming is very unhealthy. So not all of you had the opportunity to ask uh, questions. So maybe those of you who still want to ask questions or give comments, you have now the opportunity. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the um, revolving door between EU institutions and uh, agricultural um, corporations such as ADM, Cargrill, and, uh, and Monsanto. Uh, in the EU as well as between the US administration. Uh, I know that they are close with the Obamas as well as, have the, as well as they have been with the Bushs. And how big of an obstacle do you see this to the food sovereignty movement and what can we do to overcome it? I have a question to Eric and Reinhard, both of you said that um, most of the food in the world is produced by small farmers. And um, yeah, I've heard this many times uh, in other <laughs> um, events. And I asked myself, how does the um, agro-industry succeed to um, yeah, really dominate the discourse about a world food supply? Because my impression is that most of the people think or, and believe the agro-industry's arguments that we need agro-industry with genetically modified organisms and 
um, the fertilizers and everything um, that we need this industrial um, system to um, yeah supply all people in the world with food and yeah we think here it's not true but how can we change this this course Um, yeah, I would just really quickly uh, invite everyone who's interested in the animal rights topic. Uh, there's an open space at 5 uh, p.m. today, so if you want to get deeper into it, uh, we could do it there. Okay, so uh, just so you know, I'm also from Ecuador, so I share a lot of the things, um, perspective that Lucia has shared. And uh, my question is addressed to all of you. Um, that is that sometimes I feel that um, everyone is fighting for the same thing. Like we have the shared values, there's shared objectives, but we, were, we get stuck in unnecessary thing, in unnecessary differences. And I think that this conference is the perfect example. There is so many different organizations I've never heard about. And I mean, I, I, I do try to, to, to know about this, but it looks like Everyone is, is, is fighting for something, but they are also fighting against each other. So whether you are aware of how to unify these alliances, you know, how, whether you have positive ideas, like uh, to share something good about how to work together and not just, you know, like we, I don't look for an answer because I don't think there's an answer for, for a problem. Like finding the problem is part of the problem, but how to cooperate, whether you can maybe share some ideas about alliances as well. Dann, um, fangen wir vielleicht mal okay, let's start slowly and maybe uh, have the last question at the end. There was a question to Eric and Reinhold. The question was, on the one hand, it said that it's small producers who produce uh, the food, the discourse is there. On the other side, we have the discourse saying that we need um, industrial agriculture to produce food. How can we change that discourse? Eric, do you want to start? Yes. The fact is that only something like 12 or 15 percent of food produced in the world crosses borders. So what we see, we see is that the um, industrial agri-food complex uh, it has tremendous dominance over what is traded internationally. And you can say that they have the controlling interest in the food regime um, with only controlling, but very consolidated control over 15% or so of the world's food. And so with that, they can also control the ideology of the corporate food regime. And they've convinced most people in the world that we can't live without them, um, when the reality is, is quite the opposite. I don't think we can live with them. So I think it's very important to um, amplify the voices of the farmers and the pastoralists and uh, the herders and the fishers uh, and their organizations around the world um, so that we hear from them and we understand not only their point of view and the fact that they are producing uh, most of the world's food and feeding most of the world, but in fact that they are not living well. They're being exploited. They're being pushed off their land. They're being um, uh, exploited in the marketplace. They're being exploited for their labor and they have tremendous struggles. Uh, against uh, extractive industries, against the financialization of, um, of land and agriculture. So I think what we have to do is we have to um, make very strong alliances with the peasant organizations and the small farm organizations and the fisher organizations around the world, like Via Campesina, for example, uh, to amplify that voice and to bring that message out. Um. 
Ranel, the question was also to you. Do you want to say something to uh, this question as well and maybe also answer the first question with regard to the companies and the EU relationship? Now, thank you very much for this wonderful um, question, especially with regard to the revolving doors that exist between the agricultural companies and uh, leading politicians functions, especially in the EU, but also in Germany. Indeed, it's a phenomenon that we are seeing and that puts out a huge democracy, a democracy deficit. We are in a conflict. Agricultural companies do not only sell their products and want to sell their products, they also selling public opinion, and they're doing it in their own organization. One of the best uh, examples is, for example, the promotion of sustainable agriculture. This is actually a coalition of huge countries, such as Monsanto, and huge um, slaughtering um, companies. And they have this... Uh, hypocritic word uh, or um, term, term like sustainable agriculture. So these companies all presenting the public image of their companies and they are shaping public opinion and they have a farm where they show how sustainable they conduct their agriculture. And this is something I deplore. For example, through that, they're trying to shape public opinion through that image of their apparently ecological agriculture. And now, so far, people are believing the lies of the, these huge companies. And therefore, I think public opinion in a majority, we don't know, maybe it is. Uh, we, we, we can't, uh, it's not reflected in the consumption patterns of our consumers. Either we believe the promises of these uh, huge uh, food uh, producers or what we do, we buy our food from uh, small farmers on weekly markets. Now, for three years now in Germany, we've seen an increase in distribution. And now distribution is growing, so consumers I believe, are becoming more and more aware, and the public opinion is changing with regard to sustainable agriculture. My organization, Friends of the Earth, we are not selling anything. We're not selling seed. What we do, we just raise awareness and also selling our credibility, basically. So all these organizations that are here Today, if we have good arg arguments, we will gain credibility, and maybe we can also build on that. And as long as we don't gain or advance in our in in, 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 in raising awareness, then we give all these big agro businesses more more power. What we've seen also is that the farmers' association is getting seven times more subsidies than a member of another organization. And we are trying to reveal these facts, how much agribusinesses are working with maybe politicians. There was a general question, and that was also a very important question, and that was, how can our joint struggles look like? How can we all get involved? Instead of continuing to work individually, it's, also, it's about forging alliances. Now, from an ecological and social perspective, and also from a north-south um, perspective, strategically, how can we forge alliances? And Lucia, perhaps you want to start 
or shall Eric talk about forging alliances between North and South? I really think Eric is inspiring all of us, actually. So you go ahead, Eric. A prelude to addressing that is that the uh, the problem of the revolving door is simply a reflection of the increased privatization of our governments around the world in this phase of neoliberalism. And because it doesn't just happen with our governments, the, the um, influence of private of the private sector and of the monopolies reaches into our universities, into into the production of science. Um, into our societies, into our homes. So I think that it's extremely important um, to reconstruct uh, and grow the public sphere. We're losing the public sphere around the world. Um, and it's being occupied by the private sector. So we need to degrow, degrow the influence of the, of the monopolies um, within our political life. Uh, and we need to grow the private, I mean, and we need to grow the public sphere um, where we can, we can make decisions based on, on democratic agreement rather than just um, the marketplace. Because if it's only the marketplace, we will always lose against those who have the most market power. And I think that um, growing the public sphere is also important in terms of um, constructing alliances. Uh, in the past, the great social changes that were ushered in uh, at the turn of the last century um, had to do um, with labor uh, primarily. And so you had very strong labor unions, also had to do with um, imperialism, and so you had very, very strong anti-imperialist movements, you had wars of national liberation. These were the forms of... Um, of, of, of major structural social change in the world, and they introduce tremendous reforms into our societies. Um, however, um, over the last century, uh, capitalism has moved on, and so the old forms of organization are no longer effective. And so what we've seen is that um, people have uh, begun to organize around a, a plethora, a tremendous diversity of different um, uh, injustices. And so we have a tremendously uh, diverse landscape uh, of, um, of movements, of social movements and uh, of demands. Um, these will never be reunited under some sort of vanguard, behind some sort of vanguard party. Um, as they, as uh, we had done in the past. And what we need to figure out desperately is how to converge in all of our diversity. So I would say convergence and diversity is um, our, our challenge. We, we don't know how to do this, but I don't think there's any other way. And so I think we have to learn. And I think one of the, um, uh, the, the central uh, uh, tasks for convergence in diversity is the repolitization of many of our movements. So for example, the consumer movement for good food or for fair trade or, or whatnot has, has basically been depoliticized. People see themselves as consumers rather than as citizens. Um, the, as, citizen, as consumers begin to see themselves much more as citizens and as, um, and as political activists and militants, um, we will be able to construct political alliances and we'll be able to understand the difference between a tactical alliance and a strategic alliance. Um, but I think that um, this is a, a tremendously um, hopeful period uh, because we, are, we will be able to, and we have to, invent new forms of collective uh, leadership, new forms of alliance, uh, in order to uh, take us on to uh, a new society. Uh, who wants to 
answer this question or say something about strategic alliances here on the uh, panel. And uh, one more question I want to raise uh, here. I just want to say something about the question of a land problem and also the revolving doors that were addressed just now. Why is it so difficult to access land? Well, we and Rana talked about the the connection between the industry and the politics at EU level and also in Germany. What I see. I see the situation in villages, and that is also a problem. Herr Schneider, Mr. Schneider knows uh, Madam Edding, so all these um, interrelational problems. So if Christiana wants to sell land, she gets a call from somebody who she knows, and this is how it works on villages. And this is how the situation is, really. This is how the situation is, that now if we go a level higher, we see also the reason why in other areas nothing is changing. But at the regional level, in our village, for example, this is the situation. And that's why it is so difficult to change things. Now, who wants to say something from you, panelists? Just very briefly, though. Now, with regard to alliances, um, I'd like to say the following. It is absolutely important that we organize. It is important that we see ourselves as political subjects, as regardless of our situations. Now, the access to land is important. The right to land is to be given to that person who is producing food. Seed belongs to that person who is growing that seed. Now, with regard to the alliances, I would like to say the following. It is a very complex topic. We need to fight against uh, liberalization of agriculture. The free trade agreements are a huge obstacle and problem, and they have huge consequences for the north, for the south, but it, 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 it link, links us it, uh, in the north and in the south. We see that capital has no borders. The only thing that capital wants is to destroy social organizations, the social structures, everything that is different. And they just want things to benefit their capital. So we need to be careful. Now, what is our struggle? subsidies, for example, and this is a very delicate issue. We have to be careful. It can be relevant. relevant. However, a huge difficulty that uh, small farmers are faced with in the various regions of the world is as follows. Now, these small farmers, they have a huge problem with European subsidies and U.S. subsidies, and that is their problem. Subsidies have to be more universal. And that is what is linking us, the North and the South. We need to promote that what is public, that is public good, instead of uh, liberalization and privatization. For example, the s selling public goods, patenting, these are things that or topics which do not have an identity. And these are topics that bring us together. And together, as political actors, we can act jointly. We can show solidarity to our, uh, or show solidarity to our, to the producers because, because they allow us to reproduce ourselves. The land should belong to those who grow the land, to cultivate the land, and seed belongs to those who are growing and planting the seed. And the fight belongs to all of us. Uh, 
the allies are everybody or is everybody who is uh, curious because um Everybody who questions things, who put everything into questions, journalists or independent media, they are our best allies. Allies are doctors, uh, people who, who are using up uh, antibiotics. Uh, allies are the water utility uh, company, companies because resources such as water, air, these goods are currently used by a small minority in agriculture, and they are also destroyed almost forever by this small group of um, companies. The water utility companies, they need clean water, so they are our allies. We have to get them onto our side. Therefore, they also form a uh, um, are our allies when we fight against that kind of agriculture, industrial agriculture. So we actually have so many allies that we do, are not aware of. Now, for example, the American, or Mr. Filzak from the U.S. Agriculture Department, he, when the U.S. Commission tried to play down the free trade agreement by saying, no, no, we're not talking about GMO, we don't talk about uh, hormone treated uh, meat, etc. With that, the European Commission wanted to calm us down. But Mr. Filter, in, in a press conference, thankfully said, of course, it is about genetic engineering and it's about hormone treated animal, etc. And we, through that teeter, we will try to bring that in when it comes to the regulations. Uh, so Mr. Filzer was a very good uh, um, ally who spoke uh, very clearly. So we have to reveal all these um, messages, bring them out to social media. So all, everybody who's well um, connected and has good networks is an ally for us. So we'll have a last round on this uh, panel, and you all have just one and a half minutes. And please stick to the one and a half minutes. So in 30 seconds, you can say what are the real existing alternatives that are there already. So, and what do you want to um, to, to 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 share with us, burningly? And also the other 30 seconds, what can we do? What can we start with? What are the first step in order to bring about a new agricultural system? So maybe in one and a half minutes, you say that. So Eric, do you want to start? First, briefly, uh, one of the big struggles is land. It's been mentioned a number of times. And one of the reasons that land is becoming more and more of an issue, it's becoming more and more valuable within the capitalist system. And so there's a run on land, and we have all these land grabs around the world. Um, but we also have a steady encroachment of capital grabbing small pieces of land all over. And um, the reason is that the, the, the capitalist system is in a tremendous recession. There's a tremendous amount of wealth built up particularly in the banks and in the stock market. And there's nowhere to put this wealth. They're not putting it into productive activities, so they're, they're storing it in land. And this is driving the price of land up. Uh, it's to the point where in farmland, uh, the, 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 financialization, the financial value of land is greater than the productive value of land. So its exchange value is greater than its, greater than its use value. You make more money by trading on the value of land in the stock market than you can by producing anything on the land. So that's made land um, unavailable to producers. So the first thing that we have to do, the big challenge moving forward, um, in order to even think about an alternative food system, is to definancialize um, our, um, our, our economies. It's not just re-regulating the, the financial system. We have to degrow the financial sector. Desperately, we have to do that. This has to be a common demand around the world because it's very powerful. Um, and I would say, I wanted, in terms of uh, the alternatives moving forward, there are many alternatives. And we see them all over the place in terms of production, in terms of relations between uh, producers and consumers. Um, but these are small islands of sustainability and equitability 
in a huge sea of, uh, of, of injustice and environmental destruction, which is the, the food system. And so um, I think that what we have to do is, on one hand, we have to, to build links between these tiny islands by taking back the public sphere, first at the local level, um, where we can uh, exert our, our citizen power, um, and then increasingly at the sub-regional and, and national levels. Um, and then we have to change the rules and we have to change the institutions. In other words, we have to transform the corporate food regime so that all of these alternatives, which we know work and which we know are good for people and good for the planet, um, have a chance of becoming the norm rather than remaining the alternative. Thank you. So, Christiana, willst du weitermachen und Christiana, do you want to uh, continue in just one and a half minutes? Well, okay, what do I want to say? Well, first and foremost, yes, the good agriculture exists. There is a location-based agriculture. You can do it everywhere. And uh, agriculture can produce enough food for the entire world. And that is what is the most important thing that I want to do is it is possible to do it differently. We don't need to prove it to anybody because it's already proven and that's full stop. Now the second uh, thing, this concept, these concepts are, um, are wanted by people. For example, my grandmother who's no longer living anymore, she would love to have that I kind of, or she likes the kind of agriculture that I'm practicing, practicing. So what we know is that people want that. We have these wonderful uh, images on our websites uh, where you can see that alternative agriculture because conventional agriculture is still, it's uh, ugly. So it's not about relinquishing things. We know that with a better agriculture, food tastes better, it's more healthy, it's, it's, all, it's all much more fun to engage in that type of production. Now the third thing I want to say, what should people do differently? Well. If we say people buy organic food, well, I think it's too little actually, and it, that is also not a solution. It's not bad. However, for me, at this conference, I think we can go even further. What is important for me, we need to show solidarity towards people who are already engaging in alternative agriculture. I would love to ask these people here to come uh, to the country and become uh, my neighbors and also farm there. Of course, I can say that uh, there's not enough space because we don't have enough land, but it would be really nice to encourage you to come to the countryside and start farming. Well, these were one and a half minutes. Well, Rainer, thank you, uh, uh, Christiane, thank you, and Rainer, it's your uh, turn. Well, this change of system, from my point of view, requires people that uh, get involved, that can, I I regardless of um, the fact that the new movement of food sovereignty is emerging at an attack conference or s just join in and spread the news. We do have two approaches, a defensive uh, approach. What we want to do is uh, to stop TTIP, this is absolutely necessary. This is a, a priority. Then we have the second um, initiative where we want to stop um, liquid manure. So what we this is very uh, so we want to have to have a, a, a legislation that stops uh, the production of liquid manure so join us in our struggle y there's also a petition uh, done by oxfam and we are supporting so many different uh, initiatives from different uh, groups now in africa the problem is that agricultural Oh, uh, businesses are trying to write the textbooks of agricultural students. We need to stop that because they shouldn't get so much power. And what we also need to do, or what I want to say to you is, buy organic food, buy fair food, and buy organically produced food, and remain well connected.
so many alternatives, uh, you know, one maybe wouldn't be enough to, to name them. contra el Estado para asegurarse de las mínimas The best examples in Ecuador have been made where we actually moved away from the state. Of course, the state is an important actor and we have to cooperate with the state, but it is has to be relegated to the position that is adequate for the state. But food sovereignty uh, has to be maintained by local production with our own standards, with our own means and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I think uh, it has become clear uh, when dealing with questions of a, an adequate agriculture and a good agriculture for all of us, uh, there are many answers to that and there are no easy answers to that. But uh, we, it was clear, it, it has become clear that we need a, a, a shift of paradigm and a change of strategy to have a different agriculture um, it needs many actors, and it is not easy to implement. We need strategies that are participatory, that are process-oriented, that are uh, democratic. Also, if we want to overcome the status quo, there will be conflicts. We have to question the current um, power relations, and that requires resistance and a very strong counter movement. There are many alternatives that exist already uh, that have to be made more visible. Thank you very much to the interpreters. It was quite a challenge for them as well, I can imagine. Thank you. And thank you for their remarkable work. Thank you to you, Eric. Um, for getting up so early for us. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day uh, and enjoy your breakfast and your coffee. Thanks for being with us today, Eric. And thank you to you, three, uh, our three panelists here uh, in the lecture hall. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much to all of you who uh, participated in our discussion on this fourth day of our conference. For those of you who are interested in questions of uh, meat production and animal farming, there's an open space at uh, 4.30. Reinhard Reinhild, uh, mentioned a few initiatives, many initiatives that you can participate in. Um, of course, there were many of you who didn't uh, have the chance to ask the question or give their comments, but uh, we are here. Uh, please approach us. Um, please see us, and we can... Uh, speak about these issues. I hope um, you, when you go home, you take with you new ideas and uh, a new motivation, and uh, you are encouraged to continue your work. Thank you.